A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 15th of February 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. The first article here is about the maiden launch by ISRO for the year 2022. See, we all know the missions of ISRO has been disrupted due to the COVID situation in the country. Now the country is recovering and ISRO has also started resuming its missions for the year 2022. From exam point of view, we are going to discuss about the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, VSLV, and we are going to discuss about different types of satellite orbits, such as geostationary orbits, low Earth orbit, and sun synchronous orbit. Moving on to the next article, this article is about antimicrobial resistance. This is very crucial because uh, COVID has taught us to what extent it can impact our life. I think we all learned our lesson. If you did, you will wear your masks while going outside. See, I'm telling you this because the consequences and the impact it creates in our lives is humongous. And the pathogens are growing stronger by the day. And it makes it imperative to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance. From exam point of view, we are going to discuss about what is antimicrobial resistance and why is it a global concern and what are the causes of the issue. And finally, we are going to end the discussion by seeing some of the steps that are to be taken to control the antimicrobial resistance. Moving on to the third article. The third article here is about inflation. This article says that the wholesale price, uh, the wholesale inflation and the consumer price inflation has breached the benchmark of 6%. So from prelims point of view, we are going to discuss about inflation, different types of inflation and measures to control it. And moving on to the final article here, uh, this is a political article. We are not going to go deep into the issue. Instead, we are going to take the essence of it, which is the secularism. From prelims point of view, we are going to learn what is what is secularism and we are going to compare Indian model of secularism with Western model of secularism. That's all about the brief of the articles given here. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Look at this article here. This article is with reference to PSLV C-52 which injected three satellites into the orbit with precision. The three satellites includes an Earth observation satellite EOS-4 from ISRO, one student satellite InspireSat-1 from Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology IIST and a technology demonstrator satellite INS-2TD from ISRO. See the PSLV C-52 is significant because it is ISRO's maiden launch of the year 2022 and the first launch under its new chairman as Somnath. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about PSLV and different orbits of the satellites. Now, let's start our discussion with PSLV. See, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV, is a third generation launch vehicle of India. It is the first Indian launch vehicle to be equipped with liquid stages. Its first successful launch was in the year October 1994. Thereafter, PSLV emerged as the reliable and versatile workhorse launch vehicle of India. See, it launched 39 successful missions consequently by June 2017. During the period 1994 to 2017, the vehicle has launched 48 Indian satellites and 209 satellites for customers from other countries. Note that PSLV successfully launched two important spacecrafts namely Chandrayaan-1 in 2008 and Mars Orbiter spacecraft in 2013. See, PSLV earned its title the Work Horse of ISRO through consistently delivering various satellites to low Earth orbits. See, it can take up to 1750 kg of payload to sun-synchronous polar orbits of 600 km altitude. And PSLV has also been used to launch various satellites into geosynchronous and geostationary orbits. Now we'll see the different orbits of the satellites. Before that, we'll see what is an orbit. See, an orbit is a curved path that an object in space takes around another object due to gravity. The object in space here includes planet, moon, asteroid and in several cases, spacecraft also. Now let's see about geostationary orbit. See the satellites in geostationary orbit circle around Earth above the equator from west to east following Earth's rotation. 
we all know earth rotates from west to east right so the satellites in geostationary orbit follows the earth's rotation direction see it travels at exactly the same rate as earth this is exactly why satellites in the geostationary orbits appear to be stationary over a fixed position just because it appears to be fixed at a position it doesn't mean it is fixed at a certain position it will also move along the earth but as it follows the same rate as earth it appears to be fixed at a certain position you have to know the difference see the geostationary orbit is used by telecommunication satellites and weather monitoring satellites now let's see about the low earth orbit as the name suggests a low earth orbit is an orbit that is relatively close to earth surface it is normally at an altitude less than 1000 km but could be as low as 160 km above earth see the low earth orbit is most commonly used for satellite imaging it is also the orbit used for the international space station as it is easier for the astronauts to travel to and from because it is relatively close to earth surface now we'll discuss about polar orbit and sun synchronous orbit see satellites in polar orbits usually travel past earth from north to south rather than from west to east which was the case in geostationary orbits so the satellites in the polar orbits pass roughly over earth's poles polar orbits are a type of low earth orbit as they are at low altitudes between 200 to 1000 km see note that sun synchronous orbit is a particular kind of polar orbit so satellites in the sun synchronous orbits traveling over the polar regions are synchronous with sun this means they are synchronized to be always in the same fixed position relative to the sun this means that the satellite always visits the same spot at the same local time for example it passes the city of paris every day exactly at noon a satellite in a sun synchronous orbit would usually be at an altitude between 600 to 800 km so that's all about this article discussion let's have a quick recap What all we saw we saw about PSLV which is a third generation launch vehicle it is equipped with the liquid stages and it is also called the work horse of isro we saw that it carries satellites to low earth orbits sun synchronous orbits polar orbits geosynchronous and geostationary orbits and after that we moved on to see about orbit which is a curved path that an object in space takes around another object due to gravity and after that we saw about geostationary orbit which is above the equator and the satellites in the geostationary orbit travel from west to east following the earth's rotation and because of that it appears to be stationary over a fixed position this orbit is used by telecommunication satellites and weather monitoring satellites and after that we moved on to see about low earth orbit which is an orbit closer to earth's surface its altitude is not more than 1000 km and it could be as low as 160 km above earth this orbit is used for satellite imaging and it is also used for international space station and finally we saw about polar orbit and sun synchronous orbit see satellites in polar orbits travel past earth from north to south passing roughly over the poles and sun synchronous orbit it is a kind of polar orbit and they are synchronous with the sun This means the satellite always visits the same spot at the same local time. With these key points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. Now take a look at this news article from the Text and Context page. See this article talks about antimicrobial resistance. To be specific, this article talks about a study published by the Lancet in 2019. The Lancet is a weekly peer-reviewed general medical journal. See this study identified six other deadly pathogens which individually or in combination with certain drugs resulted in antimicrobial resistance. See according to a late January 2022 publication in this journal it is said that 4.95 million deaths were caused by bacterial antimicrobial resistance in 2019 alone. So this is the crux of the news article given here in this backdrop let us quickly brush through the basics of the antimicrobial resistance and we shall see some of the suggestions and way forwards mentioned in this article before that the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference please go through it 
Now, first of all, what is antimicrobial resistance? Well, according to the World Health Organization, antimicrobial resistance occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites change over time and no longer respond to the medicines. See, this makes the infections harder to treat and increases the risk of disease spread, severe illness and even death in some cases. Most importantly, as a result of drug resistance, antibiotics and other antimicrobial medicines become ineffective and infections become increasingly difficult or even impossible to treat. Now, what actually accelerates this emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance? See, the antimicrobial resistance occurs naturally over time. This happens usually through genetic changes. See, antimicrobial resistant organisms are found in people, animals, food, plants and environment. They can spread from person to person or between people and animals including from food of animal origin like meat etc. See, the main drivers of antimicrobial resistant include the misuse and overuse of antibiotics, lack of access to clean water, sanitation, hygiene for both humans and animals, poor infection and disease prevention and control in healthcare facilities and farms, poor access to quality and affordable medicines, vaccines and diagnostics, lack of awareness and knowledge. And finally, lack of enforcement of proper legislation. See, all these drivers unknowingly create a scenario which allows the pathogens to undergo genetic changes. And consequently, this leads to antimicrobial resistance. See, you should know why this antimicrobial resistance is a global concern. See, a lack of access to quality antimicrobials remains a major issue. Antibiotic shortages are affecting countries of all levels of development and especially in healthcare systems. So, this antimicrobial resistance will become a burden to healthcare sector. Moving on to the second concern, see antibiotics are becoming increasingly ineffective as the drug resistance spreads globally leading to difficulty in treating more infections and it causes even death also. See, as a result of this, new antimicrobials are urgently needed. However, if people do not change the way they use antibiotics now, then these new antibiotics, once they are produced, they will also suffer the same fate as the current ones and the new antibiotics will also become ineffective. This is a major concern. Moving on, the cost of antimicrobial resistance to national economies and their health system is significant. This is because it affects the productivity of patients or their caretakers through prolonged hospital stays and the need for more expensive and intensive care. See, the antibiotic use has increased during the COVID pandemic. Antibiotics were also commonly prescribed for individuals on a ventilator who has fever. And secondly, due to the high volume of patients during the peaking waves, proper infection management was not possible. See, the antibiotics are the only batch of drugs used in one person that can impact the rest of the community. When the gut biome is modified and excreted, it can lead to the contamination of lands and water resources, thus spreading the resistant bacteria further in the community. So, this is also a major concern regarding the antimicrobial resistance. So, without effective tools for the prevention and adequate treatment of drug-resistant infections, the number of people for whom the treatment is failing or whom die of infections will definitely increase. And there is a need for the improved access to existing and new quality-assured antimicrobials. See, medical procedures such as surgery, including cesarean sections or hip replacements, cancer chemotherapy and organ transplantation will become even more risky with the spread of this antimicrobial resistance. So, this is why antimicrobial resistance is a worldwide concern. See, according to the study, the six leading pathogens for deaths associated with the resistance included E. coli, S. aureus, K. pneumoniae, S. pneumoniae, A. baumani, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. See, they accounted for 73.4% of the deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistance and have been identified as priority pathogens by World Health Organization. See, so far we understood the severity of antimicrobial resistance. Now, let's see what can be done. 
See, the experts advise us to apply the principles of COVID control to the antimicrobial resistance control. Now, we have to ask ourselves the important question, which is, who deployed the most effective strategies against COVID? It was deployed by the public only, right? If you look at global strategy, the public has been consistently kept out of the picture. As per the article, we should involve the public and provide them with the information and announce an antimicrobial resistance action plan that will involve public in controlling the antimicrobial resistant infections. Moving on, another major strategy would be to ensure hygiene and sanitation in all places. See, in a study conducted among healthy volunteers, 14% of them were carrying cholestin-resistant bacteria in the gut that had a food source and they didn't get one in the hospital. So, ensuring hygiene and sanitation in all places is important. And finally, along with implementing hospital-based prevention programs, community-based programs that will improve hygiene, water and sanitation is very essential. This is particularly important in low and middle income countries where the burden of antimicrobial resistance is the highest and a clean water and sanitation network is difficult to come by. See, the article has also suggested that preventing infections through vaccinations will automatically reduce the need for antibiotics. See, vaccines are currently available for only one of the six major diseases, that is S. pneumoniae, but vaccination programs for the others are apparently ongoing. So, to conclude, reducing exposure to antibiotics that are in the farming sector and poultry industry is also an important factor. In this context, India's move to ban cholestin usage in the poultry industry will go a long way in reducing the antimicrobial resistance burden in the country. Apart from this, minimizing the use of antibiotics remains at the core of the fight against the antimicrobial resistance. For this to happen, the strong involvement of the community is very crucial. That's all about this article discussion. Now, let's have a quick recap. What all we saw? We saw about antimicrobial resistance which according to WHO occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites change over time and no longer respond to medicines. And after that we saw what actually accelerates the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. Under this we saw the genetic changes that the organisms undergo over time and other drivers include overuse and misuse of antibiotics, lack of access to clean water, sanitation, hygiene for both humans and animals, poor infection and disease prevention and control in healthcare facilities and forms, poor access to quality affordable medicines, vaccines, diagnostics, lack of awareness and knowledge, lack of enforcement of legislation. And after that, we saw why this antimicrobial resistance is a global concern. Because it will create a burden on healthcare systems, it will lead to more difficulty in treating the infections and it will cause even death. And we saw that the cost of antimicrobial resistance to national economies and their health systems is significant because it will affect the productivity of the caretakers and as well as the patients. And after that, we saw that the spread of the antimicrobial resistance within the community will have many adverse effects. And some medical procedures such as important surgeries, hip replacements, cancer chemotherapy, organ transplantation, they all will become more risky. And we saw the six leading pathogens for deaths associated with the resistance. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing what can be done to control this antimicrobial resistance. One is to involve public in addressing this antimicrobial resistance. Another major strategy is ensuring hygiene and sanitation in all places and encouraging community-based programs that will improve hygiene, water and sanitation. And we saw that preventing infections through vaccines will automatically reduce the need for antibiotics, which is the major cause of antimicrobial resistance. With these points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article. This article is with reference to inflation. It states that India's retail inflation accelerated past the 6% mark in January to hit 6.01%. It also breached the central bank's tolerance threshold of 6% for consumer price inflation. 
this is the crux of the article given here in this context let's learn about inflation types of inflation and measures to control it see first of all let us see what is inflation see inflation is the rate of increase in prices over a period of time that is it refers to the rise in prices of most goods and services of daily use such as food clothing housing recreation transport etc see inflation is simply the increase in the cost of living in a country inflation is also the decline of purchasing power of a given currency over time these are the different aspects of inflation now inflation can be broadly classified into two types they are demand pull inflation cost push inflation let's see them one by one so demand pull inflation is the upward pressure on prices that follows a shortage in supply that is the demand is higher and the supply is low that is the demand is higher than the supply see it is a condition where the economist describe it as too many money chasing too few goods when demand surpasses the supply the result is increase in prices this is only demand pull inflation now let's move on to see cost push inflation see cost push inflation occurs when overall prices increase due to increase in the cost of wages and raw materials see higher the cost of production lower will be the aggregate supply that is it can decrease the amount of total production in the economy since the demand for goods hasn't changed the price increases from production are passed to consumers creating the cost push inflation these are the two types of inflation now we'll discuss two important measures to control inflation the first measure is monetary policy see monetary policy is one of the most commonly used measures taken by the central banks to control inflation it uses tools like bank rate repo rate open market operations credit control policy moral persuasion etc for example higher interest rates increases the cost of borrowing and discourages spending this can control inflation the second measure is fiscal policy see in fiscal policy the government controls inflation either by reducing private spending or by decreasing the government expenditure higher income tax or lower government spending will reduce the aggregate demand this will lead to lower growth and less demand pull inflation that's all about this article discussion we'll see a quick recap we saw what is inflation it is nothing but increase in prices over a given period of time it will result in increase in cost of living in a country it also results in decline of purchasing power of a given currency over time and after that we moved on to see about two types of inflation one is demand pull inflation which means the demand is more than the supply economists describe it as too many money chasing too few goods next we saw about the cost push inflation where overall prices increase due to increase in the cost of wages of labor and raw materials here the demand for the goods will not change but the increase in prices from production are passed to consumers which creates the cost push inflation and finally we saw about two measures to control inflation one is monetary policy it is used by the central banks to control inflation it uses tools like bank rate repo rate open market operations credit control policy the principle behind it is higher interest rates will discourage spending The second measure is fiscal policy it is followed by the government to control inflation it means reducing private spending or reducing government expenditure will reduce the aggregate demand it will lead to less demand pull inflation with these key points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion Look at this news article here it states that prime minister mr narendra modi yesterday appealed to the election commission and voters in uttar pradesh to take note of trinamool congress leader mahua moitra's comment see ms moitra earlier said that her party had prevented a consolidation of hindu votes by tying up with mgp 
So, Prime Minister responded by asking whether is this democracy and secularism. And this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let's learn about secularism. We'll also discuss how Indian secularism is different from Western secularism. Now, let's start our discussion. See, literally, secularism is the state of being unrelated or separated or neutral in regards to religion. In Indian context, secularism is a doctrine which seeks to realize a secular society. That is the society which is devoid of either inter-religious or intra-religious domination. Inter-religious here means between religions, for example, between Hindus and Muslims. Intra-religious means within religion, within the Hindu community, within Christianity community, within Muslim community. To put positively, it promotes freedom within religions and equality between as well as within religions. See, the definition and forms of secularism varies from place to place. First, we'll see the Western model of secularism. See, all secular states have one thing in common. They are neither theocratic nor do they establish a religion. Theocratic is nothing but a state governed directly by a priestly order that is influenced by religion. In western model, the state will not intervene in the affairs of the religion and in the same manner, religion will not interfere in the affairs of the state. Each has a separate sphere of its own with independent jurisdiction. No policy of the state can have an exclusively religious rationale. And also, no religious classification can be the basis of any public policy. Similarly, the state cannot aid any religious institutions. See, it cannot give financial support to educational institutions run by religious communities. On this view, religion is a private matter, not a matter of state policy or law. So, this form of secularism has no place for the idea of state-supported religious reforms. Now, coming to the Indian model of secularism. See, sometimes it is said that Indian secularism is an imitation of Western secularism. But a careful reading of our constitution shows that this is not the case. See, Indian secularism is fundamentally different from Western secularism. Note that Nehru was the philosopher of Indian secularism. See, Indian secularism does not focus only on church-state separation. The idea of the inter-religious equality, that is, equality of all religions, is crucial to the Indian conception of secularism. See, the Indian state may engage with religion negatively to oppose religious tyranny. This is reflected in such actions as the ban on untouchability that was followed in the past where a certain community is prohibited from entering into the temples. See, it may also choose a positive mode of engagement. That is, the Indian constitution grants all the religious minorities the right to establish and maintain their own educational institutions which may receive assistance from the state. All these strategies can be adopted by the state to promote the values of peace, freedom and equality. And finally, Indian secularism allows for principled state intervention in all religions. For example, religiously sanctioned caste hierarchies are not acceptable within Indian secularism. The secular state does not have to treat every aspect of every religion with equal respect. It allows equal disrespect for some aspects of organized religions. So that's all about this article discussion. We'll have a quick recap. In this discussion, we saw about the definition of secularism, that is the state of being unrelated or separated or neutral in regards to religion. And after that, we saw about the Western model of secularism, which is a clear-cut demarcation of state and the religious affairs. See, they are neither theocratic nor do they establish a religion. Each has a separate sphere of its own with independent jurisdiction. And after that, we moved on to see about Indian model, which is fundamentally different from Western secularism. See, Nehru was the philosopher of Indian secularism. The crucial factor of Indian secularism is inter-religious equality. 
See, Indian secularism has two components. One is Indian state may engage with religion negatively to oppose religious tyranny, such as ban of untouchability, etc. There is also a positive mode of engagement, which is it grants all religious minorities the right to establish and maintain their own religious institutions, which may receive assistance from the state. And finally, we saw that the secular state does not have to treat every aspect of every religion with equal respect. It allows equal disrespect for some aspect of religions. With these learned points in mind, now let us move on to the next part of our discussion that is the practice prelims questions. Today we have three prelims questions here. I will solve two of them and I have a quiz question for you. Now let us start solving the question. The first question here is consider the following statements with reference to the orbit of satellites. Satellites in the geostationary orbit circle Earth above the equator from north to south following Earth's rotation. And satellites in polar orbits usually travel past Earth from west to east passing roughly over Earth's poles. See this is a very easy question and it is easy to find out that these two statements are interchanged. See, geostationary orbits circle Earth above equator from west to east direction. It follows the Earth's rotation. Here, the satellites in the polar orbits usually travel past the Earth from the north to south, passing roughly over Earth's poles. We all know poles are in north and south direction, right? So, these two statements are interchanged. So, the correct option here is option D, neither one nor two. Moving on to the second question, which of the following is related to Indian model of secularism? State will not intervene in the affairs of religion. Religion is a private matter, not a matter of state policy. No religious classification can be the basis of any public policy. It allows equal disrespect for some aspects of organized religions. Try to recall what we saw in our discussion. See, we saw two aspects in our discussion. We saw about Western model of secularism and Indian model of secularism. The first three statements, they are the characteristics of Western model of secularism. See, Indian model of secularism, it promotes inter-religious equality. See, it allows for principled state intervention in all religions. The Indian state may engage with the religion negatively and it also may choose a positive mode of engagement also. And we saw that the secular state does not have to treat every aspect of every religion with equal respect. It allows for equal disrespect for some aspects of organized religions also. From this we know that the correct option here is option D. Moving on to the final question. This is a previous year question asked in 2015. And this is the quiz question for you. The question says with reference to inflation in India, which of the following statements is correct? Controlling the inflation in India is a responsibility of the government of India only. The Reserve Bank of India has no role in controlling the inflation. Decreased money circulation helps in controlling the inflation. Increased money circulation helps in controlling the inflation. See, it is a very easy question. Try to recall what all we saw in our discussion. Attempt this question and post the answer in the comment section. I have given one main question for your practice. So, interested aspirants, write it and post it in the comment section. If you have any queries, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment. And do subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.